The community is charming, the people endearing, and the supernatural wondrous. Such is the world of Stardew Valley. You could be Ebenezer Scrooge himself, but if you play this game, you will believe in magic and in the inherent kindness of those around you. Which is ironic, because the game is all about making fat stacks. If you're not dropping millions on interior design by year three, you've either failed as a farmer or as a gambler. But to be honest, if you've failed as a gambler, your farm probably isn't looking too good either. Let's start off with Stardew Valley's backstory. You were originally from the city, but some mysterious force has driven you out. Something unnatural. Something sinister. And uh, that's about all we know. Once you arrive in Stardew Valley, you are given a dilapidated farm. There's not a lot you can do with this, but with some elbow grease and a profit incentive, anything is possible. First, you won't be needing any of this nature stuff. Get rid of it. After you've stomped out the last signs of life on your property, you may notice that there are some rather strong rocks and stumps. Your tools can't actually break these, so toss them aside and you'll find that mere boulders and pathetic old-growth forests are no match for the working man. With that out of the way, you're going to need some buildings. First is housing for your workers. Thankfully, your property already comes equipped with a cave and a five-gallon bucket. Next, we have animals. You can have cows, pigs, and chickens. Cows give milk, pigs give mushrooms, and underperforming chickens give their lives. To feed these animals, you'll need a grain silo. I recommend putting this near the top of the map as it will allow you to actually see your farm. What you'll also need is furnaces to process metals. But these furnaces don't actually go on your farm. Instead, I'd recommend putting them on a neighbor's property, or better yet, government land, because if there's anything you want to outsource, it's black lung. Life can also get quite lonely out on the farm so I'd recommend getting some non-Newtonian companions. Though I'd be careful with them in winter. The frigid temperatures make them quite brittle. Or so I've heard. But being lonely doesn't have to be a problem. There are a couple dozen people in town, and while they're all different, they do all have some similarities. They all love it when you give them 235 carat sticks of magic rock candy, but the moment you set NRC-certified Uranium-235 in their hands, they suddenly lose their thinly-veiled composure. But beyond this, they are completely different people. The first of which is the mayor. Now there are many nuanced and unsubstantiated claims that may or may not revolve around the mayor. Theories run deep and conspiracies run deeper. Ask no questions and no one will be knocking on your door at night. Next we have Pierre, the owner of the town's general store. He'll be here often to pick up the essentials. He hates garlic and loves squid. Then we have Willie. Willie is a kindred spirit. He loves the ocean and, more importantly, fishing. He thinks gold is alright and dislikes any and all fungi. Gunther is the proprietor of the archaeology center, the address of which is Museum. Don't be fooled by either of these philanthropic names. Gunther's only desire in life is to take away your hard-earned rock collection. He loves ethically sourced bone matter and hates to see you succeed. Nearby we have Clint. Clint owns the town smithy. Here you can upgrade your hoe and probably some other stuff. But what you really go there for is the gotcha system. From geodes you can get rare crystals and minerals as well as artifacts. You can also get valuable metals like gold as well. Now that I've described what you can get from geodes, allow me to describe what I can get from geodes. I am actually only ever allowed to get copper and coal. I've been compiling data to try to find out why this is, and I think I've found all of the factors at play. The game, my motherboard, this Chinese malware, and the curse put on me by a ceramic doll that was in a massive ornate pot behind a dumpster. After analyzing all of the factors, it appears to be a skill issue. Clint loves taking my money and dislikes flowers. Next is Linus. Linus is untethered from the earthly attachments of this world. He is a free spirit, and he rejects conformity and traditional social norms. But most importantly, you still pay less taxes than him. He hates anabolic steroids and 
loves coconuts. And finally, we have Gus, who has alcohol, good opinions, and spaghetti. But the uh, spaghetti is the most important of the three. You see, dating in Stardew Valley is different. So certain foods like spaghetti are not for consumption. Instead, they are a critical step in Stardew Valley's unique dating ritual. A ritual that can be optimized. Metagaming dictates that you will need to feverishly document your crush's movement, which can change based on factors like weather and cosmic influence. Thankfully, you don't need to keep track of this as a professional Excel user has already created a simple flowchart for determining their approximate locations. That leaves you plenty of time to fully utilize your all-encompassing intelligence network to give them spaghetti. If you can manage this, then your relationship with them will improve. However, it's important to consider that your relationship with them can also go down. You see, most of the villagers in Stardew Valley may get weirded out when you dig through their garbage cans without their permission, and may get a little upset when you borrow the lids. But you're not in the wrong here. They're the ones that didn't consider the ramifications of constantly throwing valuable crystals and uneaten garlic bread into their trash cans. Assuming carbs and rocks don't get in the way of your relationship, you will have the opportunity to share heartfelt moments with your significant other. Some of these involve significant levels of cortisol, unspeakable secrets, or basically nothing. But if you don't think you're ready for a relationship, there are methods of preparing yourself for one. Players are blessed with the ability to improve themselves. This improvement can come in two different ways. Number one, grinding for months on end and making daily sacrifices for the greater good of your body. This method will take a significant toll on you. Because you are not only outperforming others, you are outperforming yourself. But in the end, if you stick with it for long enough, you will be reborn as a better person. Number two, magic fruit. These methods are independent of each other. So even if you do want to try just one magic fruit, then that won't influence your grind. Again, that's assuming you only have a couple magic fruit. You'll still be fishing every day anyway, so three couldn't possibly hurt. But if you ever do get tired of fishing, you actually don't need to fish every day. You get nine days of unpaid vacation, and in up to five of those days, you don't even have to fish. The first vacation opportunity is the Egg Festival. It opens up with a fun egg hunt, which is a great festive activity for small children. What's not so great for the children is that there is no age limit on who can ruin their day. But as for the main event, the gift shop, there will be lawn flamingos on sale for 400 gold. Considering they're only sold once a year, you'll need a year's supply of these. I recommend anywhere between 300 and 600 flamingos. The next vacation will be the flower dance. Its criticalness cannot be overstated. If you don't manage to find a date by the time the first one comes around, you will never be accepted in the Stardew Valley community, and you will die unloved. Next is the Luau. It's mainly a giant potluck that the mayor uses to try and get tax breaks from the governor. But, uh, and don't tell the mayor this, but for the past three years, I've been putting kinetic sand into the potluck. This has turned the governor's bone marrow into a purple, non-Newtonian solid. For legal reasons, this is just a theory that I strongly believe in. A theory that has no factual basis, especially not in my refrigerator. Then we have the Stardew Valley Fair. There is a range of compelling things to do here. So to optimize your experience, you need to limit yourself to the essentials. First stop is to hit your bench max, then proceed to fish. After participating in these two, you will get showered in star tokens. But I'm guessing you want that star drop. I'm sure you just need one more and you'll quit. In that case, we're going to need some more coins. How do we get them? By safely investing our money. You see, the market is predictable, so we just need to believe in ourselves. But more importantly, we need to believe in orange. Malicious haters may say otherwise, but I've never lost a bet on orange. You see, I close my eyes and uh, wait for this sound. Subscribe. That sound tells me that the hand of God has descended from the heavens to enable my addiction. 
and with it, I can enable yours. Up next is Spirit's Eve. This is the time of year when the most coveted item in the game, the Golden Pumpkin, is attainable. But what does this legendary item actually do? Well, you see it uh, doesn't actually do anything. You're just supposed to give it away. It's tragic, but at least the worst light source in the game will always be there for you. Then we have ice fishing, deep sea fishing, and jelly fishing. Just make sure the other villagers don't see you for this one. Finally comes the Feast of the Winter Star, which is eating, buying trees, and participating in a secret Santa. I'll start off by saying that you do not want to invest too heavily in your gift because there have been too many times I've given away one of my most prized possessions, only to receive something that can cause severe damage to my respiratory system. However, this isn't always the case. The gifts you are giving can change depending on who is giving them. If you get Clint, for example, you win Secret Santa. Anyone else? Not so much. Marnie will only ever give you eggs, and uh, not just a couple, the full dozen. Robin gives you sticks and rocks, and all of the other villagers will give you whatever they picked up off the ground that morning. There's uh, not too much to worry about here, as adults usually won't pick up items that bring on psychologically damaging relationships with spiritual entities. Children, however, do not have this inhibition. So if a child is your secret Santa, you better hope they came across an appetizing puddle of mud before they showed up. But once you realize that festivals are only a momentary distraction, you can turn your attention towards actually progressing the game. There are, tragically, two ways to do this. Through the Community Center, or through Joja Mart. The Community Center used to be the center of life in the town before the Jumbies took it for themselves. Your saga to take it back involves a lot of fishing. The Joja Mart route, or bad ending, is a story of encroaching corporatism. You shovel money their way, and they give you everything you could possibly desire. But wait, how is it possible that corporate conglomerates were able to infiltrate this cozy, tight-knit community? Well, Stardew Valley is a utopia untouched by the FDA, and Joja recognizes this. The same freedoms that let you pile mayonnaise, raw fish, and garbage in a bin to be shipped off for public consumption are the same freedoms that allow Joja Mart to defile human decency. Some may claim, oh, uh, they're just a store. They can't possibly be evil. Allow me to explain. Joja Mart is a company whose competitive strategy is to use predatory pricing to put other stores out of business with the intent of jacking up their own prices once they've secured a monopoly. If this actually happened in real life, we'd be living in a dystopia. To make this more disrespectful, Mr. Joja gives out coupons on the Wednesdays that Pierre's shop is closed. Their marketing also consists of tossing thousands of Joja Cola cans into the city's water supply. What are the long-term impacts of such strategies? I don't know, but I imagine the trout population isn't too fond of that. And for that reason, the threat they pose to fishing, they need to be dealt with. But unfortunately, Joja doesn't seem to have a car or a permanent address. So I suggest a more direct method. Anything goes when trying to return to the idyllic village life of locally commercialized vice. Chief among these vices is gambling. The astute observer of Stardew Valley law may say gambling is illegal, but what they fail to consider is that it is illegal to gamble money. Gambling random objects has no repercussions. Winning games at the high-stakes tables can net you quite a bit of non-currency. If you take these through a roller coaster of legal loopholes, this gets converted into quite a bit of cash. Losing games at high-stakes tables can, uh, well, uh, gambling is genetic. To say it's my fault I lost that money is a gross oversimplification of the complex cosmological factors at play. And with how long I've been losing, I'm bound to win soon. That's to say, I know the truth about gambling. Not to mention there are no biblical restrictions on gambling. Furthermore, it's not like I'm gambling the money away on 2D woman. I'm making tangible gains. 
But yes, I suppose it may be a little difficult to give back our children's college fund. Fortunately, there are solutions. Unfortunately, they involve risking your life in the dungeon. It's not the most optimal outcome, but neither is losing your kneecaps. The dungeon in Stardew Valley is intense, to say the least, because you'll be swarmed by bugs, tripped by moles, and outclassed by skeletons in order to actually get to the dungeon. You see, you were going through the mines this whole time. The actual dungeon is a completely different beast. Now that I've covered all of that information about Stardew Valley, what does it all mean? Well, I've looked back, analyzed the footage, and I realized it doesn't mean anything. Disregard all of it, except the gambling part. What you really need to know is what day-to-day -day life is like in Stardew Valley. The game wants your day to start at 6, but the grind, it continues at 2. From here, you'll need to feed and pet any and all animals, water and harvest any plants, throw out mayonnaise, and do some wine tasting. This should take about one in-game hour, leaving you three hours of free time. This can be spent listening to the voices emanating from the scarecrows. Then fish. Then utilize established intelligence networks. Proceed to spend millions on online products without size dimensions. At this point, shops are almost open. So start wiggling door handles for the next couple hours, until you're violently driven off the property. Then enter the dungeon to fish. Follow that with a passionate evening with Linus, and return just in time for the day to reset. What I've covered here is only the tip of the iceberg, but I've given you all the knowledge you need to be a successful fisherman in Stardew Valley. I hope you enjoyed the video, and thank you for watching.